Hello and welcome everybody, King Demps here and we are back, this time with a preview for the IEM Katowice play-ins. I will be doing a separate video for the group stage, that will be coming in a day or two. And don't worry about the change of scenery, I just thought, you know that door right there? I just thought, that's a nice door. Now we're going to get straight into things, kicking off by talking about NIP. Oh, and I'm only going to preview the top eight teams at the play-in here. The bottom eight teams, so from Copenhagen Flames onwards, I'm doing a written preview on hltv.org. I will drop a link either in the video somewhere or in the description so you can go and check out my thoughts on those teams if you'd like. Now, the first team we are going to be taking a look at is NIP. They obviously kick off their campaign against Wisla Krakow. Now, I would expect them to beat Visla. I think they are more than good enough to beat a team that are kind of hovering around top 30. And Visla themselves look like a pretty decent tier 2 team this year um, with the changes that they made over the summer. But Nip should have too much for them. Um, and in general, if we look at Nip as a team, um, particularly looking at their results at sort of blast, they kind of were okay, not great. Generally losing to like the decent teams. Basically, they beat big twice. Yes, they took a series off of Na'Vi in a best of three, but that was the Na'Vi that we saw at Blast, which was pretty crap. So I kind of am not sure where to pin Nip with Fuzi in the lineup. Probably like a top 10 team at best. Um, I think the real kind of concern with NIP is where is the consistent firepower going to come from without Device in the team? To provide some context on that, these are Rez's stats um, from this year so far these are in the individual matches obviously from blast and if you look at this like it it is overall pretty bad um terrible against g2 bad in all of these games was decent obviously in the map that they uh, or the second map against navi um it was okay overall i guess in the series against og but like yeah just like these numbers overall are just not good enough especially for a player that is supposed to be a star player on this team we really really do need to see res step up particularly with device missing to provide some context that these are hampus's stats and as you can see in general they are better far more hard carry performances and you can kind of see the correlation between Hampus having some good ratings and NIP winning games. At the moment, NIP is basically the Hampus show. Um, if Hampus goes off and if his kind of unique, aggressive, very irritating play style pays off, then NIP are going to win games. And if it doesn't, they're not. He kind of calls around himself anyway. This is just the way Hampus is as a leader. Do I think it's good enough for a team like NIP, particularly in NIP with Device in the lineup? I'm not convinced, but with NIP in the state they're in currently, they need Hampus. Like, Hampus is absolutely vital, particularly if Rez is just not going to frag. So, um, yeah, not massive on NIP at the moment. Do I think they'll make it through this play-in? Considering they got Wiesler in the first round, yeah, I suspect they'll win that game and that gives them a good chance of going through in the play-in. They'll have two shots, basically, at qualifying. I suspect NIP have a pretty good chance to make it through, but I also really would not be shocked if Hampus, for example, has a bit of an off day or two, then I could totally see NIP not making it through this play-in. That brings us to the next highest ranked team in attendance, and that is Astralis. Obviously, they open their event with MIBR. I don't think that is as straightforward a game as you might expect, even though they did beat MIBR at the Blast Groups. I think MIBR showed flashes of looking actually pretty dangerous, obviously taking a map off of Na'Vi and beating Complexity 2-0 during Blast. So by no stretch of the imagination do I think that's a very simple game for Astralis. And MIBR have also had a demo of Astralis playing against them to watch. So that 100% is going to, I think, give MIBR a little bit of something to get their teeth into. And I really could with Astralis's kind of poor form, basically, since they put this new lineup together. I think Astralis... They're in a bad spot right now, and I could see MIBR taking this game for sure. Um, I actually don't back Astralis to get through this plane. I really don't. I don't think they're going to qualify for the main event. I think they're in really terrible form right now. I think the team does not look like it has any idea of what its identity is or how it's going to fit together. And I'll show you a little bit more what I mean by that. So these are the statistics for Astralis over the last three months. I honestly don't think I need to say anything. Blame F's playing well. The rest of them are playing garbage. 
Lucky, Zipnix, and Glaive are trash map to map. Just generally little impact, struggling to frag, looking out of their depth, and looking like they don't really have a coherent set of roles. Config is supposed to be the star of this team, really. I would say if in an ideal world, Config's actually the main star. It's not Blame F getting the work done, it's Config. And he just... He's just so, so inconsistent half to half even. Like, Config can have a half where he looks absolutely outstanding. And then he has, like, two or three where he's kind of, like, meh to just missing. And then Blame F is obviously getting all the work done. He's taking those biceps and he's smacking teams around the head with them. But it's not enough with Astralis in the form they're in. They're just going to be like a bit of a bottom feeder and they're going to slowly just slip down the world rankings, be irrelevant to tournaments, never making playoffs. Like, I don't know. This Astralis team looks like bad. It looks really bad. And I'm hoping that something will click at some point. You can't write it off when you've got somebody like Glaive and you've got Zipnix there. There is like part of the core that won so many majors and won so many tournaments and dominated the scene but it's not looking likely at the moment and the smart money i think has got to be on astralis needing at least one probably honestly two roster swaps before this lineup can do anything of note so for this catavite play-in don't expect a lot and i'm honestly expecting them to not make it through this to me is is probably the most worrying thing about Astralis is look at their 5v4 win percentage. So this is when they get a kill in the round and they are ahead. It's one of the worst that you can go out there and find. There, are no, there is no big team that's as bad as Astralis at converting 5v4 advantages. Think about that for a team whose previous identity was being like the kings of fundamentally good CS amazing team play amazing trading amazing understanding of the structure of the team and the roles and how they were supposed to succeed and this is is where they're sat currently i think that's the this right here this one stat kind of backs up the eye test for astralis and says they just look a mess at the moment and and they're such a far cry from the pedigree that is associated with that name it's kind of sad Next up, that takes us to talking about FaZe. Now, FaZe obviously are playing with a stand-in. That is the caveat that you have to put attached to their name. Uh, Rops obviously diagnosed with COVID, and we are, as of yet, unconfirmed how long Rops is going to be out for, whether he could join FaZe again at all throughout this tournament. I guess it's a possibility if they make it far enough that he could come back into the lineup. But the standing they've got is JKS, and JKS is actually a very good player. In terms of as a straight swap for swap for Rops is a pretty good swap. They're both relatively passive players. Both have a bit more of a controlled and, let's say, cerebral style about them. They're not going to run through Banana on their own and headshot two people and open up a site. Um, and so phase coming into this tournament, I actually think can still do damage. I still would expect them to have far too much for the teams that they're going to play in the play-in. I expect them, for example, to beat Sprout in their opener, and I expect them to get through the play-in pretty comfortably. And in general, FaZe have looked really, really good with this lineup so far. Yes, they made a bit of a meal of some of their games of the Blast Spring opening, going to overtime in all three of those games and losing one of them. But as they grew into the event, they looked better and better and better in general. They had that one sus map against Big, but we won't talk about that overpass. I'm big on FaZe this year, and I think they're going to do well in this Katowice play-in and make the tournament. And I think if they can settle JKS in nicely into the roles that Rops was playing, then I don't see why they can't do well. So uh, this page is basically just to emphasize my point about Rops and JKS being a decent like-for-like -like swap. As you can see, Rain and Carrigan are by far the two most aggressive players in terms of opening kill attempts. And this kind of speaks to the structure of the phase team. Rain and Carrigan are supposed to go out there and create the space, put themselves in harm's way for the late round trio of Twist, Brokey and Rops to come to fruition and to succeed. And if you just kind of take Rops and put in JKS, I think, you know, Ropsy is a better player than JKS. There's there's no denying it, especially, I think, in terms of as a carry player. Rops kind of has turned himself into one of the premier fraggers in our game. But JKS is definitely not a player to be sniffed at. I think he's still a great pickup, and I'm surprised that a tier one team hasn't tried to snap him up yet. I think that FaZe can definitely do damage still at this event, even without Rops there. 
And uh, yeah, I think they're going to slap up this play in and I still think they can go far in the main event. That brings us to talking about the boys in Entropic. Now, Entropic actually have quite a lot um, of, of kind of footage to look at for this year. Um, obviously, they're slapping up kind of tier two events. I think they have kind of outgrown that part of the scene now. Um, they still do a lot of competing. I'll be interested to see going forward if they continue to compete at so many tier two events um, because I think it's getting to the point, you know, this that result aside, um, they're at the point now where they've kind of outgrown competing in the tier two circuit. They, I think, are going to be a top 10 team this year. Um, and I expect them, you know, I expect them to beat Ents, even though this Ents team could definitely pose some problems with uh, Maiden coming into the lineup. But I think Entropic should beat Ents, should make it through this play. And I expect them to be a top 10 team for the year, really. Um, there is one kind of caveat with Entropic. And I think it's something that's just kind of stopping them from, from teetering over that edge and becoming like really dangerous and threatening to win tier one events. So I think this is kind of the problem for Entropic is their main star player is Elian and this is um, his stats page for the year so far. And as you can see in the opening event of the year, wildly inconsistent against tier one teams uh, slash tier two, obviously in the form of like it's static, but you know, he can absolutely pop off and carry you in a close game against Gambit 1.141, uh, sorry, you know, plus 12 KD, almost dropping 30, humongous performance. And, you know, for example here, that's crazy, that map against Astralis. Um, in regulation, dropping 37, 1.94, plus 23, like, th th those are huge. But then you have games where he goes missing. Like, the fact that in this series against Ecstatic, he was kind of a non-factor, um, didn't wasn't really involved in getting his team over the line at all in that one. Um, in the big series, he was... <laughs> not great. Um, in fact, his best performance in that was in the map they lost. So again, and then you go up here and you see he's absolutely farming tier two. Like, you know, that is just going to be what I think Elian does. I think he's definitely, again, he, he kind of represents a microcosm, I think, of Entropic as a team. I think too good for tier two, not good enough to kind of fully fulfill their potential at tier one. But I really am big on this team and I expect them to actually go far. Um, I would be keeping my eye on Entropic in 2022 and asking myself the question each time I watch them at the tournament, how far away are they from me calling them a genuine dark horse to win a title? And I think that that conversation is going to get more and more serious as we go throughout the year. Now, next up for discussion are the German boys of Big. I'm actually big on Big at the moment. <laughs> Banter. All jokes aside, uh, bad jokes. I think Big are looking pretty good having brought Farven into the lineup. Obviously, the campaign at Blast was successful, largely by virtue of beating Astralis twice in best of threes. The main reason I'm not getting too excited about Big just yet is because if you look at the teams they beat, it was Complexity, who I think are kind of shit this year. It's EG, who I'm not convinced of, and it's Astralis, who I think are looking pretty bad right now. But they were competitive against FaZe, so by the end of that Blast Spring groups, if you kind of discount those losses against Nip, Big like look pretty decent on balance. I think at the moment, I would, if I had to bet, I'd be like, yeah, they're going to beat Complexity. They've got a good chance of making it through this Katowice play-in. But they're kind of like hovering around that top 10 region. Are they good enough to like get into the top 10 and be a consistent top 10 team? I'm not too sure yet. The absolute boon, if you're a big fan, is the fact Searson is back. These are the stats for the last month. And Searson is back to popping heads and back to looking like one of the best players in the world. He is back to being the carry force, that big need, if they're going to be a, a top 10 team. Like just straight up. Uh, they don't have enough fragging out of Keto and Tizian. For sure, they don't have enough fragging out of those two. So the Searson, Tamsin, Farvin trio needs to be the guys getting most of the work done. And at the moment, Searson and Tamsin are 100% doing that. Farvin slotting into that kind of consistent output, middle of the road, third man kind of guy is, is fine for now. It, it definitely will keep big as sort of a top 15, top 10 hovering around that region kind of team. However, if they want to push on and really climb inside that top 10, look for top five, look to win events this year, then we need to see some development out of Farvin. But that's totally feasible, I think. I think it's totally believable that Farvin could develop and get better. And I'm hoping that this play-in event where there's a little bit less pressure, he's playing against a slightly lower caliber of team, than, for example, at Blast or at... 
Fun Spark. That was the other one. So, yeah, you know, I'm kind of down for big. I think they'll make it through this play-in, and I think they're going to have a decent year, to be honest. OG. So, Blast was a blast for OG. Uh, they looked banging. They looked like they were just slapping heads, just whacha, whacha, you know, beating the crap out of teams. Um, went through largely unscathed, dropped them out to nip. It's fine. First event of the year, new in-game leader, whatever. Uh, and that new in-game leader, Nexa, was going nuts. He was fragging out of his mind in some of these games. Um, the balance of roles, I think, looked better on OG than it did with Alexi B in charge. I think... Nexa seems to be capable of taking on a little bit more of the playmaking and fragging himself, which I think takes the pressure off of young guys like Flames, even though Flames, I think, seems to be playing even better this year and looks like he's going to step into a real star role for OG. But particularly Mantu. I think Mantu looks like and always has seemed like he has the potential to be like a really good star orper, and I think he is a good orper. But maybe that he struggles with that main carry mantle i don't think he's built for that main carry like the whole team is counting on you every game to drop 30 i think it's much better if mantu is a bit more of a luxury player and instead you have nexa playmaking flamesy developing into a big star rifler you know valder being you know nice and consistent and a great framework to build a team around as with nico actually like the more i think about the balance of roles in this team and you look at the eye test and you think about who these players are the more you're like damn we might have a team on our hands here like ooh. and all it took was one swap that i imagine g2 initiated i imagine og didn't step up to g2 and were like hey guys you fancy like giving us nexa maybe i imagine it was initiated by g2 and actually i think og have gotten a lot better as a result of this swap not because alexi b is a bad in-game leader not at all but just because nexa i think is a better fit so for katavice og make it through these play-ins and uh yeah for the year they could be pretty good. Right, next up, we are talking about Godsend. And um, there's a limit to how much I can talk about Godsend um, in terms of their play this year, uh, because they haven't. Uh, we haven't seen them this year. So instead, I'll talk very briefly about Godsend um, 2021. Basically, just developing throughout 2021, slowly climbing up the rankings. By the end of the year, flirting with a top 10 role, looking like they can hang at tier one events. And I'm really fascinated to see their development into this year. They're gonna open their campaign at the play-ins against Maus. I actually think it's gonna be a really fascinating game and one of the most interesting first round matchups. Um, very interested to see how Maus do, obviously with a new lineup, but Godsent themselves. I think Maus are a good level test for godsend if you can beat mouse then yeah you know you're probably going to be a tier one team next year um and you know let's just see where your ceiling is whereas if you lose to mouse at this play in it's like ah, they're a new roster we should probably be be beating them just because we've been playing together for so long like we should be able to hit the ground running better than they do so i think this is an interesting game for godsend and i'm going to be paying close attention to this one to try and gauge their level and where i think they're going to be at for 2022 do i expect them to get through this play-in i think this is a coin toss i really can't call this one i don't having not seen godsend or mouse this year i think it's too hard to say um but this is going to be an important game i think for both of these lineups and i'm really interested to see what goes down in this one now that brings us to our final team which is fanatic now this is a very difficult one fanatic Ended last year looking very, very good. Um, obviously, they had this honeymoon phase down here where the lineup was absolutely smashing, uh, doing really well in tier two. These sort of borderline tier one teams, they were beating pretty comfortably and actual <laughs> tier one teams beating very comfortably. Um, so Fnatic looked amazing at the end of last year. You know, obviously here losing to Gambit twice, but there's no shame in that. Gambit were the second best team overall in 2021. But then coming into this year, Funspark Ulti was like, meh, losing to Apex is not a great look, even if the new Apex lineup is is looking promising. So I don't know about Fnatic. It's, the early signs are a little bit worrying. It looks like maybe there was a honeymoon period and now it's not meshing quite the same way. I think on paper, if you ignore outside of the game, this team looks incredible. 
You got Mezzi and Brolan to be your rifle duo. You have Smuya to be a star orper. Crims is your veteran, you know, pairing up with Alex to provide that framework that the rest of the team can rock, um, can can succeed from. It looks amazing. It looks incredible. You look at those five names and you're like, yeah, this team's going to bang. If they can make it work, it's going to bang. And they were making it work at first. And now they're not. And you start to wonder, two Swedes generally tend to be a little bit more reserved, a little bit quieter, a little bit more stoic. With somebody like Smuya, a bit wild and outgoing. Alex, who has been playing in the French scene. So how's he going to mesh? Like, you start to wonder if maybe the clash of personalities is having an effect. This purely speculation. Don't get me wrong. I'm not inside the Fnatic camp, despite them being a British team. Shout out, Rule Britannia. Um, I, you know, I'm still... I'm just, I'm just extrapolating here. I'm just trying to speculate because, you know, what info do we have to go off? As for this play-in, I think Copenhagen Flames is kind of a rough opening draw in some senses because you definitely could have got a weaker team uh Copenhagen Flames are pretty decent and you if you go on you know the world rankings there there's not much to take between these two teams however on the flip side Copenhagen Flames themselves haven't had a great time of it since they looked so good at IM Fall in the major um they've been very inconsistent they've been kind of up and down and they've had some pretty poor results Obviously, for Copenhagen Flames, the move to complexity fell through, and maybe that's kind of hit their motivation and, and, and kind of knocked the team a little bit. But to bring it back to Fnatic, are they going to make it through this play-in? Again, I think they are one of those coin flip teams. I think it's too tough to call. I don't think you can reliably predict. A lot of it depends, again, on how this first game goes. So as with Godsent, I'm going to be watching very closely to see how Fnatic do in this game. Not just the result, but how they play as well. I want to see them play well. Um, come on, boys. Do it for Britain. That is the video, guys. I hope you enjoyed. You know the drill. Um, make sure if you want to see... After the tournament, how I thought all of these teams did. Scores on the Doors is a series I do. You can go check out the episode I did for the Blast Premier Spring Groups. Basically, I grade everybody from A to F, considering how I think their tournament went. And, uh, yeah, obviously, I'm a genius. I know everything. And so, like, my grades are legit. Why, why wouldn't you watch it? If you don't, are you dumb? Anyways, guys, remember, share the video, like it, tell your friends, all that good stuff. And I will see you in the next one. And if you did not like it, well, then I don't like you. Yeah. How dem apples.